I give you uh, a very, very uh, wonderful, wonderful human being who in many respects um, embodies that motto on the shield which is, I think, best understood as acquiring knowledge and living it. That is certainly true of Mark Aceto. Mark. Thank you, President Celeste. After that introduction, I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. Okay. Show of phones. Hold them up. Let me see them. Who here has texted already this morning? Let me see. Yeah, me too. Yeah, hang on. Just, I'm just going to finish one up, okay? Just. <laughs> Audience looks. Bored. <laughs> I'm worried I will suck. <laughs> Send. Okay. Oh, yeah, and hang on. Wait one sec. Let's... Everyone pose for the picture. <laughs> Smile. Beautiful. That's great. Not so great of you, but otherwise... <laughs> I'll, st I'll, I'll post this on the space book. Or the my face. All right. I learned in Keynote Speeches 101 that uh, now is the time I am supposed to address the distinguished faculty, all of whom are distinguished by the fact that they are wearing silly hats and dresses. <laughs> then I must recognize you. Actually, speaking of which, just, just, is it me or does, does this robe make me look fat? Because <laughs> I think it makes me look a little hippie. I'm just saying. All right. Uh, I also, uh, Nen, I must recognize you, uh, CC class of 2013, or to be more specific, Colorado College's 2009 freshman class, or because this is academia and we must be politically correct, the 2009 people of freshness. <laughs> Let's try an experiment. Everyone close their eyes. Seriously, really, close your eyes. That includes all these cross-dressers up here in the silly hats. <laughs> I want you to close your eyes and try to remember your earliest memory. Think about it. Imagine yourself in kindergarten, where you went to school, who your teacher was. Then work backwards from there to where you lived, who you knew, what you did. Take a moment. Really see the earliest memory you can recall in your mind. Don't worry. I can wait. I I've got some tweeting to do. All right. You got it? Now open your eyes. There is a psychological theory that uh, your earliest childhood memories indicate what career you should choose. That the events you remember most provide the map for your journey through life. And if you excavate those memories, you'll discover the job that best resonates with your authentic self. And one would argue your major as well. Of course, nobody has a childhood memories of, uh, I don't know, uh, data processing or uh, renting cars at the airport. Uh, nor is the world populated solely by ballerinas and firefighters. But an informal survey of my friends uh, yields undeniable connections, like a friend of mine who's a real estate developer who uh, vividly recalls all the houses he grew up in, or the sales manager who tried to sell his sister's toys. <laughs> My earliest memory, wait for it, wait for it, toilet training. <laughs> That's right, your parents just spent 50 grand and you're going to hear a lecture about poo. <laughs> it's okay though because now I'm a doctor. <laughs> of humane letters. I'm sorry, but is there such a thing as an inhumane letter? <laughs> I mean, besides Dick Cheney's torture menu, memo? <laughs> Still, I can feel your apprehension uh, at where this might be going. Uh, you're away at college for the very first time. You're trying to figure out who all these people are. You're trying to figure out who you are. So, uh, what I want to do for you today is tell you about my journey that led me here to CC in the hopes that it'll help you figure out what to do now that you're here. And that journey begins on the potty. 
So I am two years old, and I am seated on the toilet. I can't believe I'm going to tell you this story now. <laughs> they will never ask me to speak here again. My legs are dangling off the floor, and in the grainy movie of my mind, my father stands to my left, my mother to my right. I have just completed my business to great acclaim, and I am ready for the finale. And my father says, God love him, now unroll the toilet paper and fold it over your hand like this. And my mother says, fold it? <laughs> Who folds toilet paper? <laughs> And she pulls some, I swear to God, this really happens. And she, and my, my parents both corroborate it. And she pulls the, the toilet tissue off of the roll and she crumples it up into sort of a carnation and she hands it to me and she just says, just crumple it up. And an argument ensues. My head sort of ping-ponging back and forth between my parents while they make the life-defining decision of how I am to wipe my ass. <laughs> Is it any wonder their marriage didn't last? <laughs> now, since this event did not lead to a career in waste management, I look to the rest of my memories for clues. With the notable exception of the moon landing, which did not lead to a career in aeronautics, uh, they all, all, but was on TV, they all involved dressing up or playing pretend. My favorite activity as a child was lip syncing to my recording of The Wizard of Oz, dressed in my mother's red strappy sandals, a gingham apron tied around my chest, and a pair of brown tights upside down on my head <laughs> for braids. <laughs> in short, I was not the boy next door. I was more like the girl next door. <laughs> If I did anything else in my childhood other than spend hours drawing pictures or trying on my mother's clothes, <laughs> I don't remember it. In my case, I can only conclude that my memories signal that I am best suited for a life in the arts. Which is not to say I've had an easy time deciding on a career. Here's an excerpt from an autobiography that I wrote in the fourth grade. When I grow up, I want to be an actor and a cartoonist and a writer and a singer and a director and a producer. I would also like to be a dress designer and an interior decorator. <laughs> the only item missing is professional homosexual. <laughs> I am sure that when my parents took me to see the matinee of Annie, they walked out thinking, my son will come out tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I like that one too. At school, I felt like a freak, a cultural cliche, the lisping sissy boy who loved to sing and dance. Imagine Adam Lambert, but gayer. Turns out I was hardly unique. Uh, every school in the world has a lisping sissy boy who loves to sing and dance. I know because they are all friending me on the Facebook. One theater geek at a time. But back then, without the internet to put me in touch with my tribe, I felt isolated, alone. Navigating through a school day, I was a spy trapped behind enemy lines, churning in a constant state of anxiety as I braced myself for the inevitable moment when someone would say, FAG! But I was also very lucky because I eventually found my tribe, the misfits who dressed in thrift store clothes and sang show tunes in the hallway. The people we called in my high school the play people, as if we weren't real. The theater was a haven for me, a home away from my broken home, a safe place where I could be my most authentically audacious self. So, like the hero of my first two novels, I too dreamed of going to acting school, though despite the plot of my first book, I did not turn to a life of crime to do it. Trust me, if I had, I would have written it as a memoir, I would have gotten a lot more money for it. <laughs> In my case, uh, as mentioned before, I went to the music theater program at Carnegie Mellon University, a, B a BFA program, uh, the oldest BFA acting program in the country. I changed it to Juilliard in my novel because I figured no one would want to read a book about a kid whose dream it was to go to Pittsburgh. <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> Uh, that dream turned into a nightmare, however, when uh, I found that the faculty and I had artistic differences. I thought I could act, and they didn't. 
and Carnegie had very clear ideas about acting. There was a very specific process, very intuitive, very spontaneous, very emotional. In other words, very not me. I withered under the pressure until I, they finally just kicked my ass to the curb. I was mortified, humiliated. The small town star was washed up at 20. Failure followed me wherever I went, a, a stalker, a shadow. Uh, I infected every inch of me, a virus, a cancer. And every morning I woke up and I felt like there were two words written on the insides of my eyelids. Loser. What's worse, my safe haven, my home away from my broken home, the theater had rejected me, cast me out. Set adrift in the world, I returned to toilet training. Mentally, not literally. For therein lies the principal dilemma of my life and of every creative person that I know. Not whether to fold or crumple. That decision got decided way long ago. My mother won that debate. I don't know about you, but folding toilet paper gives new meaning to the phrase anal retentive. <laughs> if you're one of those people, good for you. I'm, I'm not criticizing. Someone's got a major in economics, okay? <laughs> For me, the conflict here concerns how I was to live my life. Should I follow my folder father, a left brain go-getter who gave up a career as a jazz musician for the security of selling insurance? Or should I mimic my tissue-mushing mother, a right brain dreamer who gave up the security of selling real estate to be a visual artist? With these two archetypes duking it out in my psyche, the animus and the anima, the yang and the yin, I am a Jungian analyst's wet dream. <laughs> then, like Stephen Dedalus in A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, I had an epiphany. That's right. I piffed. In one searing moment of clarity, I saw who I was. I am a crumpler in a folder's world. So I looked for a college that was the polar opposite of Carnegie Mellon, some place that valued the student's individual journey, some place that encouraged free expression, some place that would feed my restless curiosity. And I found Colorado College. I was impressed by the block plan, not because I so loved the idea of walking into a classroom on Monday morning and getting assigned a paper due Friday on a subject about which I knew exactly nothing, but because it signaled a respect for alternative thinking. I chose Colorado because after living in New Jersey, New York, and Pittsburgh, I was ready to live someplace, <laughs> hello, beautiful. <laughs> So I vetted the school by writing the weirdest application I could. Now you gotta understand, my transcript consisted of two years of nothing but theater classes, meaning I would do my core requirements as a junior and senior, thus doing college backwards, and allowing me to graduate as a drama major from a school where I actually did not, was not required to take any classes in the drama department. I wrote my essay as an autobiographical three-act play. And on the page where they asked me to express myself any way I saw fit, do you still do that? Do we still do that on the application? The page where you can express yourself any way you see fit? Yeah, I drew a, a, a colored pencil drawing of a mythical Dionysian scene complete with reclining nudes. <laughs> I figured that if this school would accept me at my strangest, I would be very happy here. <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> I grabbed Colorado College like a bone in my teeth, gnawing every bit of meat off of it that I could, taking part in every campus activity I could cram in, applying for and receiving grants for independent projects and convincing professors to let me do independent studies. Uh, Dick Hilt, who's sitting right behind me and fixed my collar, uh, convinced him to let me do something in acoustics in order to fulfill the dreaded science requirement. Uh, I took, you know, botany for poets otherwise to, to help fulfill that one. But not all my classmates uh, felt the same way. It may be different now, but when we three doctors uh, went here, <laughs> there were two kinds of students at Colorado College. Those of us who made the school happen, and the other kind, those who were here to party and ski. Now trust me, while your parents may have paid 50 grand for you to hear a lecture about poo, they did not pay 200 grand for you to party and ski. 
What's more, why pay for lift tickets when CC's venture grants will pay for you to have way more interesting adventures? So, my people of freshness, I would urge you to be like the students that the three of us knew and we hung out with when we were here. The ones who asked all the questions in class. You know the one. It's the one sitting with her arm resting like this. <sighs> The ones who ran all the clubs, the ones who never had a conversation sitting down. It is true, the most fascinating conversations that I had, that you alluded to earlier, um, I had when I was running across campus and I would run into somebody that I knew and we were both on our way to some campus activity and we both stopped to talk and we'd be, we'd be too busy to commit to actually sitting, but we were too stimulated not to engage in some mutual mental masturbation. And it's okay, it's completely safe. And, <laughs> and I learned an important lesson. So remember this, that the most fascinating people in the world are the ones who have the least amount of time to talk to you because they're too busy doing the things that make them fascinating. But don't believe me. In Keynote Speeches 101, I learned you're supposed to quote somebody smarter than you to prove your point and make you look, you know, like all collegiate and whatnot. So, in the words of Aristotle, <laughs> we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. Each one of you, folders and crumplers alike, has been given a precious opportunity, and I don't want you to squander it. You probably don't realize it because it's pretty much all you've ever known, but you are entering the world of ideas at the start of a seismic technological shift, a time that is not only transforming the very definition of what constitutes communication, but of reality itself. As soon as the internet goes 3D, and trust me, it's only a matter of time, we could easily find ourselves living in the matrix. Contrast that when what it was like when we were students just 20 some odd years ago. I know this is going to sound like we chiseled on stone tablets by firelight, but so few of us had personal computers that we could still hand in our thesis papers written by hand. For us, talking online meant flirting with someone next to us in the cafeteria. You, people of freshness, on the other hand, are citizens in a global community with an access to information that is unprecedented in the history of humankind. Now, I know this is going to sound ironic, com ironic coming from the guy who used his own autobiography as a parable, but my biggest concern for you is not that you will squander your parents' $200,000 by partying and skiing, but that you will squander your technological opportunities by descending into an echo chamber of narcissism. I hate to tell you, but since you were raised by the me generation, you are too often perceived as the look at me generation. I'm glad that you're all building community by keeping in touch on the Facebook and the MyFace, but I'd like you to consider for a moment that announcing to the world that you had cold pizza for breakfast does not contribute to the life of the mind. Yours or anyone else's. I fear that the information age has already degenerated into the too much information age. But you are better than that. If you weren't, you wouldn't be sitting here today. As students of one of the most innovative, dynamic institutions of higher learning in the country, you have the potential to creatively tackle the concerns of the world, to make a difference, to not rise to that challenge and fulfill that potential would be a colossal waste. Two years ago, in a poll of 18 to 25 year olds conducted by the Pew Research Center, 81% surveyed said that getting rich is your generation's most important or second most important life goal. 51% said the same thing about being famous. Now, as a freelance writer, I probably worry about money and notoriety more than the average person. After all, the biggest problem with being a renaissance man is that this ain't the renaissance. There aren't any Medici's around handing out cash, so I totally get your concerns. 
But contrast those responses with those given in an annual survey of people of freshness at the University of California, Los Angeles. In 1967, 85.8%, that is almost 86%, <laughs> said that, quote, developing a meaningful philosophy of life was very important to them. In 2005, that ambition plummeted to 45%. I cannot stress enough to you, you guys have got to turn those numbers around and fast. Without a meaningful life philosophy, no amount of money will make a difference in your lives. And without money, philosophy won't pay the bills. So the challenge I place before you then is to find the balance between crumpling and folding, to create a college experience that will prepare you both to make a living and get a life. Show of phones. How many of you have the internet in your pocket right now? Let me see. Hold them up. Yeah. To us up here, that is like science fiction. But if you remember nothing else, and so is the fact, excuse me, so is the fact that some of you have probably already tweeted or texted about what I'm saying right now. But if you remember nothing else today, I fervently wish that you will strive to succeed, have the courage to fail, work hard, take chances, and I'll see you on the Facebook. Thank you very much. <laughs>